Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Grand Rounds today. Uh, please remember to sign the attendance record at the back of the auditorium. And also, please uh, fill out the program evaluations. And I um, al always am asking for ideas that you might have in regards to future topics or future speakers. A uh, quick reminder that uh, we do not have Grand Rounds uh, scheduled uh, next week or the week after, but we will reconvene on August 15th. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Austin Bancroft. Dr. Bancroft is an otolaryngologist, and he has been a member of the Department of ENT at McFarland and on the staff here at Mary Greeley for approximately the last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has kindly accepted our uh, invitation today to update us on postoperative tracheostomy, speaking, and eating. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Bancroft. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for coming. Um, so this tracheotomy, I tried to make this as relevant as I can for any physician that might come in contact with a trach. I wanted to try to not make this an otolaryngology lecture. I tried to make it for general health staff, for nursing staff that might see these very infrequently and not know what to do with them. Uh, and so this can be fairly interactive. Uh, I welcome you to ans ask questions. I'm happy to answer anything uh, I can or get you an answer if I don't know the answer. Um, but these can be fairly overwhelming. If you have a patient that comes in, you're not familiar with, now they have an extra orifice you never knew you could have, uh, and the patient doesn't really know much about it. They just had it. Maybe they have cancer. Maybe they don't. They don't know why they had it. They came out of the ICU. Now they got a hole in their neck. Um, so this is, uh, trachs have been around for a long time. Okay, I, I read at least one article that George Washington actually probably died from some type of laryngeal obstruction. And his physician at the time, the presidential physician, had recently been trained on tracheostomy, but said that no one of the stature of George Washington could uh, undergo such a lowly procedure. So he ended up dying from his laryngeal obstruction. I don't know if it was, you know, epiglottic abscess or whatever tumor, I don't know. But um, so, you know, you could go into a barber back in the Middle Ages, I guess, get your tracheotomy and then pierce your ear at the same time. Makes for a good afternoon. Um, Tim, my clicker doesn't seem to be working. So th these are my goals today. Is I'll briefly go over what the surgical procedure looks like, why we do it, uh, what some of the immediate post-operative complications are. I think that's good for everyone to know, just to say, hey, what, what should we be watching out for? But I really want to focus today on this. You know, a lot of people just have a hard time with long-term management of trachs. Can, how do they breathe? How do they voice? Can they eat? When can they eat? Um, when can they cough? And then I, lastly, I want to address some things that, as physicians, you know, I remember being a resident 10 years ago starting and, and, and having basic questions and feeling stupid asking you know, what felt like very basic questions. And when I finally mustered enough confidence to ask the questions, I found that other people didn't know the answers either. So I tried to address things that, you know, I didn't want to ask as a beginning resident. Uh, and so many of you might have similar questions, all right? So let's just talk about indications. Indications most common by far uh, is, you know, prolonged mechanical ventilation. So someone, you know, had respiratory failure for fill in the blank, you know, CHF, they had a bad pneumonia, whatever the reason may be. They got intubated, they're on a vent, they've been on a vent for seven days. So why do we do a trach? We try not to do a trach for weaning. You know, some people like it, they feel it's easier to wean someone off of a, off of a ventilator with a trach. That's a, that's a poor indication. The reason why we typically do it is as soon as you put that intubation tube in place, it starts causing some micro damage to the, the glottis and the subglottic area. Okay, and so if that trach, or if that intubation tube stays in place for more than a week or two, um, you can start to get some serious scarring of the vocal cords and also of the subglottic area below your, vo your, your vocal cords. Uh, you can get some really significant stenosis. And that can be, r once you start to get circumferential stenosis, you know, when you have a circumferential scar, scar contracts, a small, or a small hole easily becomes a smaller hole, and that's a very difficult thing to overcome. Uh, so that's, that's one of the biggest reasons why we do it is to try to reduce laryngeal trauma from that intubation tube so that you ha can have a normal voice afterwards and to reduce the incidence of subglottic stenosis. So timing varies. There's people 
they'll argue about this long term. Uh, you'll have people do them as, as early as four days, as late as two weeks. So usually, you know, Hermson and I train together. Um, seven to ten days is probably the sweet spot. It gives you enough time to treat that patient, try to avoid them from undergoing what can sometimes be a risky procedure, uh, and oftentimes they don't need a trach. But if you're if you're knocking against that seven to ten day mark, that's kind of when you should start considering, you know, is a tracheotomy appropriate. So second most common cause that I see at least is some type of laryngeal tumor. You know, they come to me, they're hoarse, they're a bad smoker, we scope them, they've got a big pedunculated, you know, obstructing mass of their larynx. And so maybe they're going to get radiation, maybe they're going to have surgery. But even if these people have radiation, the first step in radiation before you start to have healing or regression of a cancer is going to be swelling. So if they've got a 75% obstruction and they come into my office, they're probably going to do okay. But as soon as you start radiation and that tumor swells just a little bit, there's a good chance of laryngeal obstruction and death. And so if I, if I think, hey, you know, there's this, this person's going to have a problem as soon as they start you know, their chemo radiation, I, I generally, at the time of a biopsy, to kind of confirm that diagnosis, I'll try to put a trach in at the same time. Um, if they're absolutely against it, that really puts me in a tough predicament because, you know, oncology, you, you guys have seen it. You know, they come in, they're stridulous, and now, now you got an anesthesiologist that doesn't want to touch this patient. You got to do an awake trach on a, you know, subpar situation in the middle of the night sometimes. So prophylactically, you know, if, it's, if I think it's going to obstruct with a little bit of swelling, I'll try to do that up front. And uh, any other airway obstruction, whether that's, you know, bad tracheomalacia, um, you know, growth abnormality. Um, I, I have, we actually have a couple of patients here, not done by myself, but that I inherited, who just had really bad obstructive sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea is almost 100% cured by a tracheotomy. I'd rather have a CPAP myself, but if that didn't work, you could always poke a hole in their neck. Um, and then, yeah, really bad obstructive sleep apnea. Yeah. You mean with a laryngeal tumor? Well, just basically the risks of surgery. So if I have an ICU patient, and we'll talk about risks. I mean, hey, if you've got someone that's on 10 of PEEP, and they're on a bunch of pressors, and their blood pressure is only, you know, 80 over 60 on a good day, there's a good chance of death on that patient. And then let's say now there's just such a widespread use of blood thinners, Plavix, Coumadin. Oh, they accidentally had an end STEMI while they were here for their pneumonia. Now they're on Plavix. Airway bleeding is challenging. And one of the biggest challenges with airway bleeding is you have, if we go to cauterize that, we've got oxygen, we've got a heat source, and we've got fuel. And those are the perfect breeding grounds for an airway fire. Airway fires are devastating. So just basically the complications of the procedure. So in general here, not everyone has a nice skinny neck, but uh, so you can always palpate the top of your Adam's apple. That's an easy first landmark. And then you can usually palpate that firm cricoid ring just below. That's the one that does not compress. It's the only circumferential ring. Usually I make a vertical incision about two centimeters or so. Um, I used to try to make really small incisions. Now I don't uh, because it can actually trap air under the skin. Uh, so after you get down to the trach, you kind of, I, I try not to go through the thyroid. This shows um, them doing an isthmusectomy. Uh, I, I just try to go above or below. Really, the less you can touch, the less you stir up a potential source of bleeding, in my opinion, the better. And then usually you like to make a, an incision between the second and third tracheal ring. That's the textbook answer. Uh, so in the, in the operating room, you know, this is one of my most important tools. This is called a cry cook. So basically, once they're good and asleep, uh, and you're, you find your airway, this hook just hooks that cricoid ring. You give it to a nurse, and you say, don't move this ring. This is the one thing. You know, this, this holds your airway in place. And then before I make this incision, everything has to be bone dry, OK? Because this is my last time that I can really cauterize well without being at risk of an airway fire. So if I have a little bit of minor bleeding, even with this incision, I'll let it bleed. I'll let it bleed a little bit just because at that point, you know, most of these people are in respiratory distress. They are in a heightened, you know, um, oxygen supplementation. And so you just don't want to, you don't want to risk having a fire. So a little bit of bleeding is tolerated. You make that incision, 
Uh, this one shows a vertical incision. I wouldn't recommend that. I know Hermson and I both don't do that. And then there's a myriad of different ways to address the, the trachea itself. So um, Hermson and I, I believe, both do this. Uh, this, whenever possible, whenever I can safely do this, I do a Bjork flap. Um, a Bjork flap is where basically you cut through the third laryngeal cartilage ring, um, and you make a little inferior based flap, and then these sutures here are sutured to the external skin. This does have some downsides to it. The downsides are it can make post tracheotomy swallowing a little bit more difficult because now your trachea is somewhat tethered to your external skin. But one of the big safety reasons why I do this is um, if that tracheotomy tube happens to fall out, we now have some form an, of an established track to make it easier for you or me to help put this back in. So it makes it a little bit more stable. Okay, so basically this Bjork flap, just you make this little garage door, you suture it to the skin, so if that accidentally pops in, you at least have a sutured track. Some people don't do that suture at all. They just spread it open, stick the tube in. That's very acceptable as well. But if it comes out in that first week before that tract has healed, it can be ch a little bit challenging to get that back in. Uh, this is very common in kids. If you're doing a pediatric trach, uh, if you ever, or if we ever receive a trach uh, from an outside facility, sometimes you'll have two sutures, one coming out of the right side of the neck, one coming out of the left side of the neck, and it's just labeled left and right. Uh, and so what they'll do is they'll kind of make their little hole there and they'll make a left and a right. And the, the thought is this is, you know, if the trach tube falls out, you grab those two sutures, you pull them to the left and to the right. You got a hole there. It's the same thing as the Bjork flap. And then you got a track to follow it and you stick it back in. Okay. Uh, I don't do that. Hermson, as far as I know, does not do that either. I don't know what they're doing here. I've never done that. Looks like they're doing the same thing, but superior and inferior. Um, so, but if you see sutures, that's probably what you're looking at. All right. So overall, technique is pretty, pretty simple. Um, so this is a cross section, the cadaveric section here. Um, here's the larynx here, the bottom of the larynx. Esophagus is back here. Here, I don't know if you can see this. It's all black and white, but um, these are the anterior aspects of the tracheal rings. Okay, this is that innominate artery. We'll talk about that and aortic arch. So, you know, I wish everyone was this skinny that I did a trach on. Um, you know, this, is, this shows a, you know, anterior thickness of less than a centimeter. That is, that is great. When, I, when I'm doing a trach on a patient like that with a nice long neck, oh, that's, that's, that's a treat to me. Um, unfortunately, they're not, they're not always, so oftentimes you have a very thick neck, you know, um, and it, it makes the complication rate and difficulty of surgery go up. Um, so, basically, after you make that, that stoma, that hole, um, that trach tube, it's supposed to stay right in the trachea. And then you have this inflation cuff here. Okay, you can hook yourself up to a ventilator. Pretty self-explanatory. After the procedure, I will sew this flange to the neck so that hopefully it reduces the risk of that coming out in the first week. You know, coming out in that first five to seven days before you have an established tr tract can be very difficult uh, in some cases to put it back in. So I suture it in place usually for that first week uh, and we'll talk about more. All right. All right. So let's just talk about parts. Uh, and I've got, I've got some demos down here. So this is a very common look of a trach. Um, you've got a few different parts. It always comes with an obturator, an inner cannula, and an outer cannula. This one is a cuff trach, you really can't see it. Uh, but this cuff, just like a regular intubation tube, I'm sure you guys are all familiar, you know, you've got a balloon that inflates that, that cuff. Uh, and then this inner, why do you have an inner and an outer cannula? The reason is, is so that if you end up with some type of mucus plugging, you can clean that inner cannula without having to remove the entire tracheotomy tube. So every patient that has had a trach for more than a couple weeks and who is awake, you know, they're not comatose, I like them to start doing their own trach tube cleaning so that if they run into difficulty breathing, A, they can maybe help verbalize or signal that they need help and then also hopefully be able to do some troubleshooting on their own. The more that they can do on their own, the safer that trach is. Nothing makes me more frustrated than a patient with a new orifice who doesn't want to learn how to take care of it. 
Uh, it's dangerous and it's lazy. Um, and so I, you know, every patient that I have with a trach, I'm happy to hold their hand. I'm happy to walk with them to teach them how to do their own trach care, but they have to learn. I don't care if they're squeamish. They have to know how to, you know, because I'm not going to go home with them. And if they have a problem at three in the morning, if they call 911 and they really have an obstruction, they're dead before they get there. They need to know how to, how to troubleshoot their own trach. It's very important. Um, So this is my simple drawing, uh, neck, chin, trach, right? So here is um, here's just an inflated trach tube. So basically, uh, insert it. This one has fenestrations on it. We'll talk about those. I'm not a big fan of fenestrations, but in case you see it, you can see what that looks like. Um, with the cuff up, of course, you should not have any kind of laryngeal air escape. So that's just like an inflated intubation tube, OK? However, with that cuff down, um, you can basically have them potentially breathe in through their mouth and breathe out through their mouth. With that cuff up, they can't breathe in or out with their mouth. So this is that inner cannula that, that comes out. You can clean that out. They can clean that out. They should be cleaning it out. You shouldn't do it for them. Um, you know, so if there's any mucus, uh, they can get rid of that so it doesn't plug up and cause them to have an airway obstruction. And then this is what an obturator looks like. An obturator always has a real, you know, shiny, smooth end to it. And when it's put in place, all it does is it allows an atraumatic entry into the stoma so that, you know, if this were to ever fall out, that's the number one step is take that inner cannula out, put that obturator in so that you can reinsert it. Okay, so it just makes it smoother. With that in, I just want you to notice there is no lumen, so you can't breathe with an obturator in. So after that, you take it out, you put your inner cannula back in. They can either breathe accordingly or you can hook them up to a ventilator. All right. This is similar to kind of a telephone jack. You know, you just kind of squeeze it together to get it to release. This is an uncuffed trach, so this would be for somebody who's not on a ventilator, um, so no cuff. And then this one locks a little bit different. You can see the arrow here locked to the right. It kind of clicks. And so after you unclick it, same thing. You can take out that inner cannula to clean that. It's real, really pretty simple. But you know, your hint is there's no balloon tube. So if you hooked this uncuffed trach up to a ventilator, you'd have a huge air escape. Okay, it's not, you're not going to be able to ventilate someone with any kind of pressure. They can breathe if they have a laryngeal obstruction, but if they're here for a bad pneumonia that needs, you know, heightened, um, you know, positive expiratory airway pressure, um, you're not going to be able to generate that pressure. You're going to have to replace that with a uh, with a cuffed trach. Fenestrations sound like a great idea. So fenestrations, the reason why you have that is if you take out that inner cannula, now you have an opening from the tube into the bottom. So basically, you know, they can hypothetically breathe through their oral airway, right? Through their mouth. As soon as you put that inner cannula, notice there's no fenestrations in that inner cannula. Now they can no longer do that. It sounds, I mean, it sounds like a great idea. The problem with fenestrated trachs is they typically kind of butt up against the back wall of the trachea. And if people have these for months to years, which they oftentimes do, you can get some granulation tissue that kind of grows into those fenestrations. And if you're suctioning through there or just from regular manipulation of the trach tube, it can easily bleed. And patients don't like that, um, and, and nor do I. Um, we'll come back. All right. Oh, th the other thing that I want to point out is on all of these, there is typically some letters and numbers, you know, on the flange of these. Um, and so like this one says no cuff, okay, that's a good, and it says six CFS. Um, I if you ever consult me or Hermson, you know, with a trach problem, that's one of my first questions I always ask is, hey, do they have a trach? What type of trach is it? I I'll want to know those letters and numbers because that's the size A, and then it tells me does it have a cuff, does it not, kind of what, what are the limitations of that trach? So I, I wouldn't expect you to memorize anything like that, but that might be useful for, for us. Let's talk about complications. We talked about why don't we just do it on everybody. Uh, so pneumothorax, you can easily have a pneumothorax from this. Uh, I have seen this multiple times. 
um, where basically you can have either through positive pressure. Uh, I, this used to happen a lot more with poor anesthesia. Um, you know, when you look back 50 or more years, and I think it was more from just really high pressure anesthesia that might actually cause rupture of a bleb or something like that. Um, but you can have a pneumothorax, subcutaneous air. So if they're, you know, you basically have a violation of the trachea into, into that subcutaneous plane here. So if there is a cuff leak, it's not uncommon for air to extravasate into the subcutaneous plane. People come in with Rice Krispies under their skin. You can easily palpate it. Um, but when I see that, I'm, I'm hesitant to jump to the conclusion this is just sub-Q air. I'll always get a chest x-ray because that's really your first sign of a pneumothorax as well. Um, mucus plug, like we just talked about, you know, this is dry air. It has not been moisturized through the oral pharynx or through the you know, nasal cavity. Dry air causes crusted mucus. If you crust up mucus in that tracheotomy tube and that plugs up, you know, they can't breathe, they die. Okay, so mucus plug is a big thing. Infection, pretty rare, surprisingly, right? You got this, you got pus coming out of their lungs. Uh, you'd think, man, they're all going to die of, you know, massive infection. They don't. Um, and then false passage, that's a real bad one. False passages, for whatever reason, that tracheotomy tube now has popped out of the trachea. All right, we're not ventilating the lungs. Um, and we'll talk about that. And then bleeding, we'll talk more about that. And then death, you know, a lot of these... It's probably not a complication of the actual procedure, but these people are sick, and so they make it back. You know, any surgical mortalities, any, any death 30 days after a procedure, a lot of these people, unfortunately, are kind of teetering that scale. So uh, death is a real risk. All right, so let's talk about false passage. This is one of those things that can kill people early. Um, so what are the symptoms? So how do you know when this thing... So here you can see this is the trachea. And from the outside, this trach tube looks relatively normal, right? The, stone, the flange is against the skin. It's right where it needs to be. It's pointed the right direction. But man, oh man, they're satting 28%. You, you're using huge pressures when you were using normal pressures before. There's subcutaneous air. Their chest is inflating everywhere. Um, and now you can't suction. You don't know if there's a mucus plug or what. Um, so when I have seen this, the, the worst case I saw of this was a patient that had had a trach earlier that day, and he was, you know, long-term ICU vent patient, and, you know, nursing staff trying to do their job excellently. You know, they were turning the patient to put pillows under one edge. You know, they didn't want a subcutaneous ulcer of any sort, and then accidentally they, they pulled on that trach. It was sewn in place, but it did false passage. These exact things happened, um, and, and uh, all of a sudden they had a, a very hypoxic patient. Um, so that's, you know, a large manipulation, especially with a fresh stoma. That's kind of your, the, the history. It, it's difficult to get a false passage if someone's had a trach for more than a couple weeks. At that point, you have a scar tract that's formed. It's not going to pop out as easily. You could still do it, but it's more difficult to do. So what's the management? Even though this patient has just had a recent trach, this patient, unless it's for laryngeal obstruction from a tumor, can still be intubated by mouth. And that's real important because it's one thing if you always have an ENT resident here in house and you know what, they'll be there in three minutes, so don't worry about it, just wait three minutes. But if that's not the case, this patient can still be orally intubated. And that's real important to remember that. You need to know what is my bailout maneuver. And so oftentimes, if you know, if you, you should call the ENT that did it, right? That should be your first call. But man, if they're about to die, if they're desatting, and you can't ventilate that patient, even if I only live 10 minutes away, that's too long, right? They're not going to make it. Uh, so you have my permission, at least, if, if you are suspicious of that, and you do have the ability to intubate, and you're comfortable with that skill set, to cut out those four sutures, rip that trach out, and orally intubate, okay? So this gentleman I told you about that, you know, the nurse, nursing staff was kind of rolling him from side to side, and he false passaged. That's exactly what they did. I had an experienced intensivist in-house. She came by, um, and they, in the meantime, actually, they didn't call first. First, they, they just called her, and so she tried to orally intubate. And you know what happened? Is they, she was able to pass it through the larynx, and pop, it popped out of the neck. So she intubated successfully, 
and all of a sudden the, trach the intubation tube came out of the neck. So she repeated, same thing happened, and so she was very frustrated, and so they then got me on the phone, uh, and I said, that's, that's fine, you know, stick your finger in the hole. Stick your finger in the hole so that it doesn't pop out of the neck, you know, and so they were able to easily intubate. By that time, the guy had massive sub-Q air. Uh, we got a chest x-ray. He actually ended up having a bilateral pneumothorax from all of the manipulation, uh, and then that was treated by general surgery. Um, and, and they were able to ventilate. So that's, you know, if, if that happens, just remember, all we're doing is basically cannulating a big tube. Feel free to stick your finger in that hole. You're not going to, this is not a sterile procedure. It's clean, contaminated, put a glove on. You know, at this point, they're going to die from hypoxia rather than, you know, infection from a dirty glove. You don't want to use a dirty glove. You're going to use a clean glove regardless. Um, so ET tubes can also false passage. But instead of them false passaging this way, they'll false passage through the trachea. A lot of people, I'm not a big fan of uh, dressings behind the flange of a tracheotomy tube. And this is the exact reason why. If you got somebody, I mean, this is a perfect specimen. You got a nice skinny neck. Um, but if you have an o obese neck, and then, and so this is already kind of pulling a little bit anterior, that obesity, that, that fat pad is pulling that trach tube anteriorly. And now you take a wad of gauze and you stick it behind that flange as well, that's also pulling it further anterior. So in my opinion, you know, these, these dressings that go behind a trach flange in a, fr in a fresh trach probably increase your risk of false passage. So I'm not a fan, and that's why I'm not a fan. You can put it around the edge. You know, people don't like to, to have mucus coming down them. I, I get it. It looks, you know, family's concerned, but you know, especially in that first week or so, I, I don't like addressing behind that. So just think of this picture when you do, you know, go to stick that in, uh, and especially if you're sticking your finger under there, like nursing staff, if, if there's any nursing staff here, oftentimes they'll you know, stick their finger under there. Your finger's about a centimeter in, in diameter, and if you're sticking that under there, you're potentially anteriorly moving that trach an additional centimeter to whatever that, you know, on top of the girth of that neck. So um, not a big fan. So this is, this is something totally different, right? This is the tracheotomy tube, a very schematic drawing. You've got the esophagus here, your larynx here, your trachea here. This is a laryngectomy, all right? We don't see those very often. They used to be very common. Now they're not as common. There is no communication in a laryngectomy, or very little, communication in the laryngectomy between the oral pharynx and the trachea. I'm familiar with one case of a gentleman who had a laryngectomy, came in for respiratory distress, he did poorly overnight, and, he, and they made the decision to intubate in the middle of the night and could not intubate. And they tried several times to intubate this gentleman, uh, and for some reason they would put a tube in, and they'd hit the goose. Put a tube in, hit the esophagus again. They tried three or four times, and his, his stats went down throughout that. And what was the problem? The problem was he had had a laryngectomy. Uh, it was an unfamiliarity with laryngectomies, and he had a big hole kind of staring at him right in the middle of, the, of his neck, and nobody wanted to use it because they felt uncomfortable doing that. Um, but you cannot intubate somebody that's had a laryngectomy without doing significant damage. Okay. Because if you do intubate somebody with a laryngectomy, what you've done is you've ruptured through this partition wall between the esophagus you know, and the laryngostoma. Uh, so you don't want to do that. Um, so feel free. You, know, you can ask their surgical history. Hopefully you have enough time to do that uh, or ask their family. But you can always use that hole. That's usually a well-established trach or well-established tract. Um, I did, we had one example of a laryngectomy tube. You can see the subtle differences of these. A laryngectomy tube is usually much smaller. It has less of a 90, so the you know, regular trach almost goes a complete 90 degrees. A laryngectomy tube won't go quite uh, that full 90 degrees. And then it also shows LGT. I don't know if you can see that, but the L is laryngectomy, laryngectomy tube. So it's a hint, at least. All right. So if you have you know, if you have a stoma, you, can, you don't have to have a laryngectomy tube or a, or a trach to put in there. You can also, you know, you can put an, a cupped trach through there. Um, 
That's easy, right? It's 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 a that's a reasonable way if you if you just don't have access to the proper equipment. That's okay. They can live like that. They can live like that, you know, for days hypothetically. All right, so bleeding. I'll try to make this go a little quicker. Um, most oftentimes, minor bleeding is from people that, you know, they pass their, their suction tube several times, and then you just get scuffing of this posterior tracheal wall. You can have some minor bleeding through the, through the stoma. Um, surgical bleeding, so that's usually not through the cannula. Usually it's from under the flange. And the reason is, is most of that bleeding, if it's surgical, is going to come from that surgical tract, not from deep in the lungs. Okay. Um, and then, unfortunately, I know some people are familiar with an innominate artery rupture. This is massive bleeding. This happens very rarely, but basically, depending on location, you know, this cuff, if people have a long-term trach for several years, you can get pressure necrosis of this anterior aspect of the trachea that can rupture into that innominate artery, and that, that is usually, usually fatal. Um, so th I don't want to scare you with that because, you know, really, it, so in my 10-year career, I've only seen two of those. It's very rare. Um, sometimes you'll have pulsitation of the tracheotomy tube before, but that's a very nonspecific symptom. So sometimes it's right, but usually it's not. Yeah? No. Yeah. Perk trachs? No, so normally the innominate artery is going to be below the sternum. So you shouldn't be in that area. You should be fine. Um, no. So when I've done perk trachs, I, I typically do not use an ultrasound. But what I'll do is, you know, oftentimes it's done with a pulmonologist. They will, I'll make my initial incision, just a small incision. And then when they're scoping that trachea, I will kind of poke on the, on the trachea just to see where I am. But the risk of you hitting the innominate for doing a perk trach, if you're doing it, you know, two centimeters above the sternal notch, you should you should be out of harm's way. So I wouldn't worry about. That's a complication. I've only ever seen one time, um, and it was not on a primary trach. So usually I do not. All right. So this is something that I think is very important for, especially internal medicine physicians. Um, is you know when does that patient have an effective cough? Okay. So this is one common question. Who who wants to go on the record? Does anyone think, and I won't call on you, who thinks that a trach would help a chronically aspirating patient? Does anyone think that trachs help aspiration? Does anyone think that trachs hurt aspiration? Okay. Yeah. So a lot of people say, hey, I have a chronically aspirating patient. Can you put a trach in that patient? And I'm real hesitant. And the reason is, is it's real important to figure out where we get effective cough. And we get effective cough from um, some type of neural trigger. You know, you have stimulation of the larynx. And then you need a significant air column to push up through the trachea and force whatever is abnormal in that, in that uh, larynx or trachea out of the larynx. So if you have a trach, this one has no cuff. And let's say this person's eaten a muffin, and a little bit of that muffin gets in their, their larynx, and they cough. And they don't have a cuff up. They don't have a, a one-way valve on the trach. Well, when they cough, they're going to basically split that pressure. Half of that pressure is going to go through the trach. Half of that pressure is going to go around. And so it actually makes clearing that airway much more difficult for that patient. They're going to they're gonna have a very ineffective cough. So. One of the most unsafe types of trachs for aspiration is a cuff down trach, so meaning or no cuff trach with no valve on it. So when they cough, air comes out everywhere. They can't generate enough force to clear that larynx. So what's a solution to that? A solution is what's called a passimere valve. A passimere valve is a one-way valve. So this is a silicone. Um, diaphragm inside of this grate, and you snap this on the end here so that air can go in, but it can't come out of there. Okay, and so if they breathe in, they're going to have less resistance breathing in. They'll be able to easily get uh, air into their lungs. But then when they cough, that air cannot come out of the trach. It'll only go out of out of the trachea. And so then they, they as long as they have enough muscular strength to generate a cough, 
they'll be able to clear their own airway. Um, I brought an example of that as well. So this is, so if we had an uncuffed trach, all right, this is a passimere valve, um, and you can open it up to clean it. And I don't know if you can see here, but there's actually a silicone sheet there. You can see the sheen just a little bit. And so that's a one-way valve. It'll flex in um, to allow air in, but then when, it, when you breathe out, it forces it against, against the grate there. And this just pops in place there. I won't use this unless a patient is able to reach up and take it out, take it off themselves. Because sometimes this gives patients the uh, sensation that they can't breathe or exhale. Um, so. so if they can't take this off to clean it, if it gets you know, stuck with mucus, um, then, then it's a no-go until they're able to do so. So this was an, uh, so a lot of times so a passimere is the actual the actual name the uh, other name that people oftentimes call this is a speaking valve. Uh, one of the questions I had when I was an early resident is you know does this is this a speaking valve does this generate sound because it looked like kind of a you know rubber diaphragm kind of like a duck call are you generating some kind of vibratory sound the answer is no it's only a one way valve it does not generate noise whatsoever or it shouldn't. Um, and so, no, it doesn't generate voice. All it does is allow them to generate an air column to voice, force air out of the larynx so that they can, they can speak, okay? Um, all right, so what about deep suctioning? A lot of people say, oh man, there's all these secretions in this patient, can I just suction this out of this? Why, and where is this coming from? Is this stoma infected? So, when is this helpful? Deep suctioning, meaning taking, you know, whistle tip train a whistle tip suction and passing it down the trach into the lungs to try to get that junk out of there might be useful if you have someone with a bad purulent pneumonia that you think is plugging up some of the bronchi and you're trying to you know lavage that out or suction that out but oftentimes by doing deep suctioning if you're going beyond the tip of the trach really what you end up doing is just traumatizing that trachea and so I, unless there's a good reason to do real deep suctioning real vigorous suctioning it's just not necessary and it can cause some issues, so I try to avoid it. Um, all right, so what are some safe, some common safety practices? Now, I, so basically, usually I will suture that flange in place for the first week. I know Hermson's very similar on that, just to try to stop some of that manipulation. Um, usually the surgeon that performed the trach should do that first trach change because we're familiar with that patient. It's never fun to receive a trach, and you're like, I don't know, was this easy, was it hard, they're obese, I'm not sure. Did they do a Bjork flap, did they not? So usually that should be done by the surgeon. Um, this is an important one. An inflated cuff and a speaking valve together are not compatible with life, right? Why is that? The reason why that is, is this patient, if you have a speaking valve on, remember, they can only breathe in through that trach but now you have a cuff up, so air can't get around the trach. And you have a one-way valve on, so air can't get out of the stoma, so you can't exhale. So that patient can breathe in, they can't breathe out. So normally I won't allow a, a speaking valve or that passimere valve if A, the patient can't take it off themselves, and B, usually I like to do it with an uncuffed trach just to try and reduce them having a, an instance where they just can't exhale or can't breathe. because. It, that's not compatible with life. And then this is also just as important as far as myself goes, is an uncupped trach without, without a one-way valve, that increases people at risk of aspiration because they can't generate an effective cough. So that's just as important as, you know, if you don't cap a trach, you don't, you don't have that cuff up and you don't have that one-way valve on, they can't effectively clear their own airway. And that's real important because then you're, you're predisposing that patient to the risk of aspiration pneumonia. Um, and tracheostomy alone does not reduce the risk of aspiration. Um, and then this, you know, I'm a real stickler about this. The more that patients can do themselves, the safer it is. That patient that's real sheepish, I'm sorry that they have laryngeal cancer. I'm sorry that they're squeamish. I'm sorry they didn't want that, but they need to get to grips with it. They need to get a mirror. They need to learn about how to take care of this because if they have a complication at home, they need to know how to manage that themselves. Um, and then in the ICU especially, you always need to have all of the replacement equipment to the bedside, including that obturator, and one size smaller in case you had to emergently change it. 
So that's all I got for today. Um, if you guys have questions, I'm happy to answer it, but hopefully that answers, you know, when can they voice? How can they eat? You can eat when you can cough effectively. If you can't cough, you can't eat, because if you can't, if you can't cough, you can't clear your own airway. Um, yeah. Yeah. Most of it. So we still have a bunch of Jacksons here, um, and uh, they, some people love them. Um, they don't have the ability to cuff. There's no cuff on those. But no, especially if they have a cap, you can, you can wash those in the dishwasher. You know, people love them. Some people do have nickel allergies, and they do have nickel in them, so that's one thing to keep in mind. But now, if you don't need it, if you're not anticipating that patient being on a vent, it's an option. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a long, durable trach. Yeah. So orally eating with a trach cup up. I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. The, the one downside, can I have my picture back? Um, the one potential downside is if you have a big balloon here, you are putting some posterior pressure on the esophagus so they can get a little bit of solid dysphagia. But if, if that's not causing a problem, I'm okay with that. Now, if they get something in their larynx, they're going to have a hard time clearing that. Um, but, it, you know, you can always deal with that. It shouldn't go in their lungs. Um, so I, I'm not against that. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you for having me.